Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Parush Kera. I'm a second year PhD student and a member of Cyber Lab at the University of South Florida. I will be presenting our work, a closer look at mobile app usage as a persistent parametric, a small case study. So as we know, like uh, smartphones are like basic needs right now for everybody and everyone used their smartphones for uh, performing sensitive operations. By the time we were writing this paper, there were more than 5 billion smartphone users in the world. And they use these smartphones to perform sensitive operation like monetary transactions and uh, buying of shares and for video calling and uh, uh, for many other sensitive operations for, uh, for which we have to make sure that only the user is performing that. And uh, it, arri it arises the need that there should be a robust authentication system on all of these mobile systems so that the data cannot be taken out without the permission of the user, or we have to make sure that the operations, sensitive operations being performed using that smartphone, only the user is performing it. And we have seen that right now, smartphones have adopted uh, a very good way of authenticating the users, that is by using the phys physical biometric uh, features. Previously, they used to use uh, passwords or passcodes, but they can be forgotten and, and stolen. And uh, that's why they have adopted to physical biometric systems. And we know like in our iPhones or any other phone, we now authenticate by using our fingerprint or by using our um, iris, eye scanning. That's the way uh, using the physical biometric, they authenticate the user in today's world. But there is another uh, biometric uh, feature that can be used for authentication called as behavioral biometric. And this has been used uh, and previous research has shown that uh, it shows some promising results. Um, so when I talk about behavior biometrics, uh, behavior biometrics, I mean like the behavior of the user. So for example, uh, how the person is walking or what is the behavior of the person using some different applications on the smartphones. Or um, I can talk about uh, how the like what is the pattern of uh, the user, how it is, how he's touching the smartphone and various different behaviors that can be used to authenticate um, the user. So these patterns in the mobile application usage data have been previously shown that they can be used for, authenticate, uh, for authenticating a user. And uh, while we are performing authentication based on the behavioral data of a user. There are generally three assumptions which are um, which are taken uh, and under consideration. So these three uh, assumptions are that uh, the outcome uh, of user's interaction with the smartphone data is generated constantly. So the data is being generated constantly, like with every touch or with every new app you are opening, there is a behavioral uh, data which is reflecting your behavior, like how you perform on your smartphone. That data is generating constantly. And the most recent data is the most reflective of the behavior of the user. And the third assumption is that the data is inherently non-permanent. So despite of these uh, three assumptions, uh, we focused on uh, trying to find if there is a persistent uh, biometric behavior exists in the way the user used their smartphone. So we wanted to see like if there is a persistent biometric behavior, which can precisely tell us that a particular user is trying to use uh, the smartphone and that user itself is the owner of the smartphone. So. In this research, we hypothesize that a persistent application usage pattern do occur. When you use your smartphone, the, the, the pattern of the usage of your applications reflect your behavior. And we hypothesize this that a persistent application usage pattern do occur. So we all know that there have been many uh, changes uh, in the technology in the past decade and the inclusion of various different kind of sensors in the smartphone have changed the 
uh, the way authentication works. So there are many different kinds of sensors in our smartphone, like accelerometer, which tells us about the movement of, of the person. And there is a uh, gyroscope, which tells us about the direction in which the person is moving. There is a magnetometer, which tells us about the orientation of the person using. There is touch sensor. There are proximity sensors, which can tell how far is your mobile device from a particular object. And there are many sensors which are available in your smartphone uh, that gives a lot of data. And uh, that data can be used to see if there is any pattern. And uh, similarly, like in this application, we have used the patterns which are found in the metadata of uh, incoming and outgoing calls and uh, what is the screen time for how much time you're using the screen? What is your application history? What, what are the applications you have used in, in the past some time window? And uh, at what time you were connected to a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth? So all of these applications uh, we have used in this research and uh, using these different sensors, the data has been collected from smartphones. So this is a basic biometric uh, system uh, architecture. So how does this work is basically to authenticate a particular user. First, we have to enroll the user. So uh, let's take an example. When you buy a new phone, when you open the new phone for the first time, you first have to enroll yourself. You first have to give your biometric information to the to the device so that it can store your biometric information and later you can use that information to authenticate yourself. So first you have to, uh, for the very first time when you open your device, you have to give your fingerprint scanner in different orientations. So to make sure that every time when you try to authenticate using your finger in different postures, it, it can still recognize you. Similarly, you do it with uh, the iris recognition. You have to tilt your face with the phone so that it can capture your eye movement and all uh, to authenticate you later. So the very first uh, step is to enroll your data enroll your biometric information in the device. And later on, this uh, biometric information can be used for identification and authentication. So when I say about identification, let's suppose, let's take a scenario if you're using, an, if you're working in a company and uh, the, the, the way to authenticate so when you when you go when you're working in that company, you have to mark your attendance there that you were available. So in that case, the biometric system uses an identification system where you give your uh, uh, sample when you when you scan your finger over there. The biometric system matches your um, input to the already enrolled different users in that biometric system. So to identify that which one which user is among all of these users you are, you are trying to be. So that is identification. Authentication is different from identification. So authentication is definitely what your smartphones have. So if like in iPhones, you know that there can be only one, uh, like the iris data can belong to only one person. So when you try to open an iPhone, um, it makes sure that the person that I have, uh, the smartphones make sure that the data that I have of a user is the same user who is trying to open the smartphone. So this is a basic um, uh, architecture uh, that there is a enrollment data stored in the database and how uh, a user authenticate and identify the different devices. So. In our data set, uh, we have different logs of mobile application usage from 15 Android users. And uh, we recovered, we recorded these. Uh, so we have used this data set of, uh, from a source which is cited. And um, these logs were recorded from January uh, 2nd, 2012 to uh, May 5th, 2012. And through and November 1st, 2012 to September 1st, 2013. So this is, uh, this is varying over the time. And the average number of days of which we have the data is 297 with the standard deviation of 70. And the smallest uh, log of application usage of users in days we have is 168 days. And we have the longest uh, log of application usage data by a user is for 414 days. So there are 443 different unique applications and uh, 
minimum application used by a user is 38 with the maximum is uh, 138 and average is, uh, sorry, maximum is 138 and the average is 138. So what we try to do is we try to convert this representation of logs into images. So we converted the data of, we converted the application usage data of each user into images. So if we have an image, the X axis represented the, 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 the application. So we have a different, we have 38 different applications and uh, all of these, uh, so sorry, we have 443 different applications and all of these applications were, encoded uh, with different numbers using an encoder and uh, the x axis represent a numerically converted application like it it is basically the name of the application but converted into numbers and the y axis represent the time in minutes for what time a particular application was used by a user and the pixel intensity at x x y uh, point provides the information of application x at a time y so I'll, I'll show you uh, this in the images coming in the later slides. So while we were converting the applications to images, we used uh, the, the concept of application frequency. So we used three different measures to calculate the frequency of the application usage. So the first one is the global frequency. So there are 443 applications across, uh, uh, we computed the normalized frequency of 443 applications across 15 different applications. So if we have one application like F1 and we have a the frequency of that particular applications will be FA over submission of FI. This is the basic uh, frequency calculation and we normalized it. And similarly, we have used the normalized frequency of 443 applications uh, users at a, at a pixel, as a pixel value. And the third metric is per day. That is a normalized frequency of 443 applications per user per day. So one is per user per day, one is per day, and one is the global frequency, the overall frequency of all the applications used by a particular user. So in this process, we considered a uh, um, a particular time window of three minutes, because if if we were using the whole uh, 24 hours of window as a representation of the application usage of a, of a user, the images were very long because uh, because the y axis is going to be very long, which is representing 24 hours a day. So we we considered like uh, taking small windows of three minutes to avoid elongated images. And those three uh, minute sessions will be like from 12 a.m. to 12.03 a.m. and subsequently for the 24 hours. And obviously there might be, there might be some scenarios when a particular user is active uh, more at, uh, at some point of time in the whole day. So to, to take in account that we have used global frequencies of each application. And uh, when user is more active between between different apps in a three minute session. So for example, if if there are like five applications, A1 to A5, which are used in a three minutes window and their frequencies are F1 to F5. So, and their global frequencies are FG1, FG2 and FG5. So the, the final frequency of an application uh, within a three minute window will be FI times FGI over submission of FI times FGI. So this particular process, process resulted in 4,451 images. Since this is a very less data to apply a deep learning on it, we also applied uh, 15 different Gaussian filters on the images to generate more data. and to generate additional images. So we used uh, 15 different Gaussian filters to apply on images and to generate more data. And uh, the, the, the idea behind applying the um, Gaussian filters was to generate additional data and to reduce the application information into the images. After these, uh, after applying these filters, we had a total of 66,765 images. 
So this is uh, this is the representation of uh, the usage of application by a user. So if you can see the y-axis tells us about uh, uh, the application, like, sorry, the y-axis tells us about at what time a particular application was used by a user. And x-axis X -axis tells us about the different applications under consideration. And a point at x, y tells us the uh, uh, the pixel in intensity, the frequency of that particular application used by a user at a particular time. So if a particular application is used by a user at a particular time is more, the frequency will be more. Hence the, um, the, the pixel intensity at that particular point will be more. So as I told you, like there are three different metrics that we have used, a global frequency, a local frequency, and a per day frequency. And this is the result that we got when we converted the frequencies into application. So when we converted the, uh, when we applied the Gaussian filters on it, uh, we can see um, some good results and some uh, different kind of results. So when we applied the Gaussian filter size one, we get more precise image like, uh, the image is more separated out and we can visually see and differentiate like which application was used at which time. It is giving us more clarity. But as we increase the Gaussian filter, we can see that the images are getting blur and pixel intensity is being distributed to the neighbor pixels, which, uh, which gives us the illusion like a particular app was used on different times of the day, but it is not true. It is just because um, the the intensity of those pixels were getting shifted to the neighbor pixels because of the high Gaussian filters. So it gives us an impression that a particular app was being used at different times, uh, like at different times of the day. So we used all these images and in the next slides, I will tell you like how it uh, changed the results. So. Before uh, giving these images as an input to our uh, convolutional, so we used convolutional neural networks here. Uh, we have, uh, like, uh, we have seen in the previous research, and there have been many arguments, like, which says that um, rectangular neural networks outperforms uh, convolutional neural networks significantly on activities uh, that are short in duration but have natural ordering. Whereas a recurrent approach benefits from uh, contextualizing observations across long periods of time. So for, so for, so for a pro prolonged and repetitive activities, we used, uh, we recommend use of uh, convolutional neural network. So the final images were um, resized to 50 by 50 size, and we shuffled the images and split them using five-fold cross-validation. And we trained, um, a whole convolution neural network on it. And we conducted this experiment 12 times. Um, that, that is going to be four times of each different, four times for each different types of frequencies. So we use dropout layer to simulate the scenario uh, where users are uh, inactive. And we randomly remove 20% of the images and split the data uh, into five folds. So we used F score as a metric for the uh, evaluation, and um, we compared the uh, we compared the performance of our convolution neural network with uh, with Ada Boost classifier, and uh, that was the baseline uh, to compare with. And we used um, default parameters uh, for Ada Boost. So for the CNNs, we have the uh, images from each from which the, the network extract the features. But for the Ada Boost, we converted the image data into 1D vectors, one dimensional vectors. And uh, those uh, data was used by the Ada Boost filter to uh, perform the classification. So if you can see here, uh, so from F1 to, so, uh, so these notations, F1, F2, F3, F5, they represent the filter size. So if you can see uh, here uh, that the performance, it increased uh, basically when we were using the convolutional neural networks. So when we are using the hand engineers featured features, um, when we gave them input to add a boost, uh, only we can see that there is an increase in the accuracy and uh, only for the filters from F1 to F7, but there is a decrease in the accuracy while we are using high filters uh, from F8 to F15. Uh, the reason is that 
it is making the images blur and uh, that distribute the pixel intensity to enable pixels and thus uh, there's a misclassification because of that so high filter sizes makes the images more blur and uh, so you can see that using the hand engineers features for adipose filter and both the cnns the accuracy have increased uh, but while using the cnn it outperforms the the baseline classifier there is a decrease here in the accuracy here in both the uh, in both the classifiers i will explain why there is a decrease in this class so you can see like there is a decrease when we are using the frequency global from filters using f1 to f7 but there is an increase in the frequency uh, like for the per day and local frequencies but there is a decrease in the global frequency i'll tell you the reason that why there is a decrease in the global frequency so we as we have seen that both the both our cnn have uh, outperform the data boost uh, classifier here and the reason uh, that why there there was a drop in the accuracy while we were using the the global frequencies the it is because to be distinguished by global images two users two users have to use the same application uh, at different time of the day so so global frequencies tells us about the um, uh, inter user relation whereas the local and per day images minimize the inter uh, similarity which provides details about the application usage pattern of different users and this suggests that many users may use same application around the same time of the day so the key findings from this research is that convolutional neural networks learned patches of activities by users over time while also approximating what a user is doing and it it also indicates that hand engineers features are really necessary uh, and uh, it can be used to classify the uh, the behavior of an uh, a user using the application data and cnns has also outperformed the baseline adipose classifiers so uh, the limitations of this uh, uh, research is that we, we had a very less number of users 15 users and uh, our work is only limited to the frequency metric across the day and the comparison was done with only one classifier so in uh, in future we tend to uh, compare it with more classifiers and uh, we tend to have more data more than 15 users and we, uh, we we tend to use different metrics and not only depend on the frequency these are the references thank you so much i would love to answer some questions if you have